Am I still on? I'm on now? Okay, great, great. Welcome. I greet you in the name of my Savior. I'm happy as heck that you're here. And um, I trust the Lord's got a word for us today. Um, my wife, uh, with great tenacity and patience and um, forbearance, has spent 40 38 and 4, 42 years, 42 years trying to pull me out of the, the darkness and ignorance um, and, and shallowness that I was, that I came into this world with uh, and bring me into some form of um, Cooth, thank you, thank you. I'm trying to find the right word. There's a lot of words I could use, but cooth will be, that's fine. And uh, just about every afternoon, uh, we take a walk, and she tells me about things that she's teaching, and uh, authors, and books, and poems, and, um, and I love listening to her tell me things. And every once in a while, I will come across something that I'll share with her, and I, I can tell she's like, I can't believe you knew that. Um, so uh, one of her favorite authors or poets is a fellow named T.S. Eliot. And I know Kiki adores him. And uh, I don't know whether you've been reading in the paper, but last week he uh, was in the paper uh, a number of times. Now he's dead. He was one of the greatest uh, poets of the 20th century. And he was actually born in America, born in Missouri. Uh, but he, as soon as he could, he, <laughs> he moved to England and went to college over there and loved it so much that he stayed there. And uh, married there and, and uh, you know, uh, won the Nobel Prize for literature. And uh, he's a major player in Charlie's world. And um, anyway, last week marked the 50th anniversary of his death and <clears throat> some letters were released um, that were donated that he wrote they were donated uh, but the, the, the stipulation was they couldn't be released until 50 years after he died okay and that was last week and I'm just going to read to you what, what, I, what I read. It said, last week some letters were released that T.S. Eliot wrote to a lady that he had had a long-term relationship with. It was not a physical relationship. In fact, it was a long-distance relationship. But uh, this was a lady other than his wife. Later on, when he was older he reflected on this relationship that he had with this, this lady. They were sort of pen pals. But it was a very intimate pen pal relationship, if you will. And on reflecting on this relationship, T.S. Eliot said that he realized that he was not in love with this lady, but rather he was in love with the feeling of being in love with her. Let me read that again. He realized that he wasn't in love with this lady, but rather he was in love with the feeling of being in love with her. Feelings that he had, he had experienced as a young man. He said, I came to see, now listen to this, he said, I came to see that my love for her was the love of a ghost for a ghost. Wow, that's a powerful line, powerful statement. I came to see that my love for this lady was the love of a ghost for a ghost. And the letters that I had been writing to her were the letters of a delusional man vainly trying to pretend that he was the same man that he had been in 1914. 
It was not about her. It was about the feeling that she gave me. The feeling of youth. And I read that. Uh, and you can Google T.S. Eliot and there'll be a zillion things that'll pop up because of last week. And um, uh, I read that and that hit me. I can't express to you how that touched me. Um, he was in love with that which created within him the feelings. Our society is madly, passionately in love with youth. We as a society, as a culture, we idolize youth. We're consumed with looking young, dressing young, the activities of the young. We live as if life is behind us. And the only thing that we look forward to, the only thing that is in front of us, is death, the grave. And we try as a society in any and every way to cling to that which will keep us from moving forward. Anything that will keep us young. Keep us from moving into the future. Because we associate the future with death. Isn't that odd, or maybe it's not odd at all, that the Bible encourages exactly the opposite. In fact, the Bible casts a very skeptical, cautious disdain over everything related to youth. Read Psalms, read Proverbs, read, read Ecclesiastes. All three of those books encourage us not to pursue things that are associated with youth. Attitudes, feelings, behaviors, actions, values. In contrast, the Bible, in particular those three books, Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, they encourage us to pursue things associated with age, with maturity. In fact, the phrase that, the, that, that Solomon liked was the crown of old age. Pursue things that are associated with the crown of old age. A crown that the Bible says is gained By a lifetime spent pursuing God. The Bible says don't chase your past youth. But rather pursue godliness and maturity. And the blessings that God has for us in the future. This idea of focusing in the future, focusing forward, looking ahead, valuing that which is to come over that which has already been. That's a theme that runs through the entire Bible, old and new. I was shocked. I've never, I love, I, other than kissing my wife and holding my grandson, I love preparing a meal for you. I love doing it because every week it's, it's, I'm using ingredients and, and seasonings, if you will, that I've never used. And I love it. This meal that I had no idea I was going to get to enjoy. And I love it. It, it, is a, it is a gift beyond what I can express to you. And I had no idea when I read that T.S. Eliot deal 
where this was going. But I started looking throughout the Bible for these, this theme that God says, focus on the future. Don't cling to the past. And just listen. Listen to some of the things that I found. The Bible does say, and I don't want to take away or, or negate, the Bible says, remember the past. Be thankful for the past. Learn from the past. Absolutely. But the theme of the Bible, or the, one of the things that runs through the Bible is, don't dwell in the past. I find it very significant. Uh, my wife would tell you that any good book, how it begins and how it ends is huge. Right? Is that right, spouse? Okay. How it begins and how it ends, that's huge in the mind of the author. I find it very significant that the Bible begins, the book of Genesis, continually future focused. The theme of Genesis is, y'all have made a mess. Now let me begin a plan to undo your mess. The focus throughout Genesis is future, future. I find it significant that the last book of the Bible, Revelation, it's future focused. Everything is coming to be. Everything is focused on what God is about to do next in the lives of His people. The Old Testament. Let's start there. What God tell Adam and Eve? Don't stay in Eden. In fact, it's so important to me that you don't stay where you've been I'm going to hire a full-time cherub or angel or angelic being. I forgot which one he was. But whatever he was, I'm going to hire a full-time dude to stand in front of the gate so that you cannot go back. I want you moving forward. The theme continues with Babel. Hey, let's, uh, we like our life. We like what we've had. We like what we've got. Let's huddle together. Let's gather together and stay where we are. And God says, no. That's no good. That's not, that's not a good plan. Let's not focus on what, where we've been or where, where we are. Let's focus on something. I want you to go out and conquer and subdue and multiply and create. Let, join me in creating a new world. So I'm going to change everybody's languages so that everybody speaks different languages. Don't stay in Sodom. Don't stay in Egypt. Don't stay in the wilderness. That was the whole thing of those spies that went, went out, looked at the promised land, came back. Oh, there's challenges and obstacles and dangers ahead. Let's stay where we are. God says, no, no, no. That's not the plan. That's no good. Keep moving. Keep going forward. Keep your eyes ahead. The promised land is in front of you. I mentioned the angel that blocked Adam and Eve from going back into the garden. Genesis 11, God mixing up people's speech so they couldn't stay where they were. Genesis 12, 15, and 17, probably the three most important chapters in the Old Testament. Because in those three chapters, God explains to Abraham his plan, his long-term, big-picture plan for his covenant people. And what is that plan? Summarize that plan. Summarize the plan that God gave to Abraham and to all of his descendants who approach God by faith. The summary is simple. Follow me into the future that I have for you a future that is beyond your wildest dreams. Genesis 22, God says, I'll bless you. I'll multiply you. I will conquer your enemies. And through your descendants, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because of your willingness to follow me. Follow me forward. Go move. Keep moving. Keep going forward. Keep your focus ahead. Isn't that the whole point of the story of uh, Mrs. Lot? 
What happened with Ms. Lot? Why was that a bad deal? Uh, here's a lady running from her home, from, run, running from her city and her home and her, her family and friends and her life. And the angel said, Lady, don't look back. Don't dwell on the past. Don't long for what you've had in the good old days. Ooh, I would love to call names in here. I won't. The good old days. Some of y'all, I know what you're, hey, how you doing? Oh, I can tell you what you're going to say. Let me tell you about what went on in high school. <laughs> what went on in high school? Or what went on in college? Or what went on when I was in my 20s? And I'm like, golly, sucker Bill. Who cares about all that? Lot's wife lost her life and she turned into a, not only a pillar of salt, but into the symbol of what happens to people who long for the past and keep their eyes looking backwards. Exodus, uh, yeah, chapter 14. God told his people through Moses, quit crying. Or actually the phrase is, stop whining. That's really the way it's, it's a better. Stop whining. Get up. And go forward through the sea, for it will divide, and you will go to the other side. Number, I want to sort of summarize these two chapters. Numbers chapter 11 and Numbers chapter 14. If you summarize them together, here's what it says. God's people remembered the good things of Egypt. Now think about that. Think about what Israel's life was like. Isn't it amazing how... The past that we remember is so different than the past that was. It's amazing. The past that I remember is so different than the past that was. Here's the Israelites. God's people remembered the good things of Egypt and began to complain. Oh, we remember all the delicious food that we had for free in Egypt. Well, sure, they were feeding you free. Slavery's cheap. We remember all the delicious food that we had for free in Egypt. So why is the Lord taking us to this new land only to kick to Egypt? Family slaves, let us go back to Egypt. Jeremiah chapter 29. I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good, plans to prosper you, plans that involve giving you a hope and a future. And then Isaiah 43, forget the past, for it is nothing compared to the new things that I have for you. Isn't that a lovely promise from God? Forget the past, for it is nothing compared to the future that I have for you. You might think, well, that's, that's fine, Jim Dandy, for the Old Testament. You know, how about the New Testament? I didn't really know where to begin here, uh, because in a, in a very real sense, the ministry of Jesus... He came to begin something. Jesus didn't come. Well, I mean, yes, he came to end death and the devil and loss. He, he did come to end. But in, in a very real sense, Jesus came to begin something. He came to announce the coming of his kingdom. He came to usher in something new that was beginning. And I thought about, you know, if you had to take two verses that sort of encapsulated what is the message of Jesus and the message of the New Testament. These are the two that I came up with. 1 John chapter 2 says, The world and all that it contains is vanishing away. But people who do the will of God will live forever. 
Isn't that the message of Jesus? Everything you see, everything you can touch, everything around you, it's all vanishing away. It's all going away. It'll be gone one day. And the world and all it contains is vanishing. But people who do God's will will live forever. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Focus not on what is visible. Rather, focus on the invisible. For the visible is temporary, but the invisible is eternal. I thought about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus, we don't know how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Talk to your Father. Acknowledge where he is. And acknowledge that he is holy. That his name is holy, it's sacred, it's unique, it's special. Then what? Right out of the gate, first thing Jesus tells us to pray is what? Thy kingdom come. It's future focused. What are you supposed to pray to Jesus about? What are you supposed to talk to the Father about? His First, before your needs, before this, before your sin, focus on the fact. God, my eyes are on the future, on your future kingdom. Matthew 24, right before Matthew begins uh, the, the last week of Jesus' life and the, his, his, uh, 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 his uh, death or his arrest, his betrayal, his, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, right before Matthew does that, he writes Matthew 24 and 25. And I was just pondering those two chapters this week because they're probably, well, there are no two chapters in the Bible more eschatological than Matthew 24 and 25. And I thought right, as Matthew introduces this in Matthew 24, he says this. He says that Jesus and the disciples were walking through the temple and the disciples were going, Woo, Jesus, look at, look at what we've got here. Look at this temple. Aren't you impressed? I'm impressed. Woo! Look at how many years it took to build this. Oh my goodness, look at what we've done and look at what we've got. And shockingly, rather than Jesus going, I'm impressed too. Wow. You know what Jesus says is? In just a few years, everything you see is going to be gone. What's he saying? He's not just prophesying. He's saying, get your stinking eyes off of what you've had and what you've done and what you've got and get your eyes on what's ahead. And I could go on and on and on. Now, just a few more verses. Luke chapter 9. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to a plow and looks backwards is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 17, Jesus says, Remember Lot's wife. If you cling to your life, you cling to that which you've had and have, you'll lose it all. But if you let that all go, you'll save your life. Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, I'm not saying I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that for which Christ has possessed me. No, I've not achieved it. But I am forgetting the past. And I'm looking toward what's ahead. And I press on to finish my race and gain the prize that God has for me. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I fought the good fight. I finished my race and I've remained faithful. And now the crown of righteousness awaits me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at his return. And he will give this same crown of righteousness to all those who are eagerly, eagerly looking forward to Jesus' return. There's literally a crown that people will get, that you and I will get, if we are excited about and focused on the return 
of Jesus. And then finally, Hebrews 11. Paul says, Abraham by faith left his home for a land that God would give him. Even when he arrived in that land, he lived by faith like a foreigner, as did Isaac and Jacob who inherited the same promise. They were confidently looking for an eternal city, one designed and built by God. Those people died still believing what God had promised them. They didn't receive what God promised, but they saw it from afar and they agreed with God that they were foreigners looking for a home of their own. Now notice, listen, if they had wanted their past lives, they could have returned, but they were seeking a better place, a heavenly home, and therefore God isn't ashamed to be called their God. If they, were, if they wanted to go back, they could have. But the implication is they would have missed the future that God had for them. For the most part, I know y'all. I would declare to you while a lot of churches are preaching on the evils of this and that and the other, stop doing these bad things, start doing these good things. I'm going to tell you where many of us in this very room are. We are wallowing in our love for and our longing for the past. Oh, I wish I had my, I wish I had my career back. I wish I had my health back. I wish I had this and that. I, I, I long for the good old days. I just want you to leave today remembering that people who look backwards too much, they stumble, they fall, they miss out, and they lose a lot of races. People who spend too much time looking backwards, they stumble a lot. Try it sometime. Just light out across that golf course right there running backwards. See how you do. You stumble a lot. You fall a lot. You miss out. One of the things my wife is always telling me, Larry, Slow down. Do you see what's right in front of you? I'm so task oriented. I want to do things, accomplish things, make things better. I'm, I'm so focused on the task that so often I miss the beauty that's right there in front of me. And you lose a lot of races. I want to ask you three questions and we're done. First question. This, I've got a Bible verse for each one of them. Proverbs chapter 12 says this. People who work their land have abundant food. But fools chase fantasies. People who work their land have abundant food, but fools chase fantasies. My first question for us is this. Am I trying to cling to and recreate the joys and the thrills of my past or am I trying to create something new and wonderful and better? Wonder if T.S. Eliot had taken the time that he had invested in that imaginary, delusional, those are his words, relationship, and had invested them in his relationship with his wife. 
Wonder what could have been created. Wonder what could have been possible. How many men are so, I want that thrill of the back seat of a Chevrolet with some girl in high school. So much that I, I'm blinded to the treasure that lays beside me and eats across the table from me. Now, fair is fair. How many parents spend their, spend a disproportionate amount of time trying to hold on to that family image that they had in years by, by gone. And they make everybody miserable. I've got a dear friend, one of my favorite people on the planet. She is driving her precious, brilliant, beautiful, wonderful daughter, adult daughter, stark, raving, mad, because she will not let go. She will not let go. She will not focus on what can be because she is so terrified of letting go of what has been. Am I trying to cling to and recreate the joys and thrills of the past more than I am trying to create and experience the wonderful future that I've got. Number two, Hebrews chapter 12 says, Let us throw off every hindrance, especially all that easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that God has marked out for us. If that first question didn't hit you right between the eyes, and I'm sorry it didn't, but if it didn't, I'm hoping this one will. Am I letting the things of my past, the sorrows of my past, the mistakes of my past, the failures of my past, the wrongs done to me of my past, am I letting the things of my past hold me in the past and keep me from moving forward? You know, that's why the Bible talks about so passionately and consistently about the danger of unforgiveness. Revenge. Living in regret. Self-pity. Playing the role of a victim. The danger of fear. Late idolizing belief. Idolizing people that have died and then all we can do is focus on these people that used to be in our lives. Regardless of how great or horrible my past has been, does God have the power, the wisdom, and the love to give me something better. Number three. Psalm 37 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. You know what that word delight means? Some of you that have been with me a long time, you know I love that word. It's the, literally the word that means what a cow does when it eats grass. It ruminates. It chews and chews and chews and swallows and then spits it back up and chews and chews and chews and then swallows and then spits it back up. It mulls over. It ponders. Delight yourself in the Lord 
and you will experience the future that God has for you. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. The things that you long for, God will give them to you. If you and I learn to treasure His Son, His Son's beauty, His Son's depth, His Son's complexity, His Son's power, His Son's holiness, His Son's wisdom, His Son's love. If you and I will focus our time on grasping, growing in our understanding of the beauty and the power and the depth and the greatness of God's Son. God says, I'll give you everything you could ever want, everything that you could ever desire, everything that you long for. I'll give it to you. But the appreciate is that you and I Learn to appreciate the beauty and the value of God's Son. And through that doorway, we'll experience the future God has for us. You know, one of the things that my wife's taught me. The more complex, the more Deep, the more truly beautiful, the more valuable something is, the harder and the longer it takes to really understand it and appreciate it. I can read a mad magazine, which y'all probably don't know what that is, but I can read a I can read Sports Illustrated or Gun and Gun, uh, Garden and Gun or whatever. The, I can read some of these I can read silliness and I get it first blush. I can't do that with uh, Macbeth or Brothers Karamazov. I can listen to Katy Perry. I can get it the first time. I can't do that with Mozart or Beethoven. I can look at some connect the dots picture that me and my grandson are doing on the kitchen table together. I get it the first time. I can't do that with Monet or Rembrandt. And you can't either. And if it takes a lifetime to understand and value and enjoy the best that mankind can create, how long do you think you and I ought to spend getting to know the Son of God? I read the Bible last year for a few months. I started out on that reading through the Bible deal you guilted me into. And I mean, you know, I got I got tired and bored. And uh, you know, I I read that for a couple of months and and uh, gave up. Bully for you. Wow. You want some applause? A prize? It'll take us eternity to grasp the beauty and the complexity and the depth and the glory of the Son of God. Do I delight in Christ? Is Jesus becoming so valuable and so beautiful to me that I will give up what I have to gain what I don't yet have. Remember that passage? I think it's in Luke. <coughs> oh, I 
think it's Luke 18. I think that's right. The Bible says that a man walked across a field and he realized a treasure buried in the ground. And he realized that that treasure had great value. And the Bible says he went and sold all he had to buy the land to gain the treasure. That man would have never given all he had to buy a bunch of dirt unless he was convinced that the treasure in the land was worth it. I pray, I beg the Holy Spirit to convince us that the Lord Jesus is a treasure worth giving up everything to get to know and to love and to experience our dead kin folks, our success in high school and college, our toys, our families. Nothing wrong with any of that stuff. Our past marriages, our past relationships with our kids, our past uh, uh, success in our careers. But it's all in the past. It's all looking backwards. And my Bible says that what God has in store for us makes all the that all that's in the past it makes it pale in comparison. Whether our past is filled with unbelievable abundance and success or whether our past is filled with famine and failure and pain. In the eyes of God, your best days are ahead if you and I will learn to delight in the Lord and follow Him and learn to see and value what he sees and he values. Your best days are ahead. Well, now you don't know my life. No, I don't. But I spent time this morning with the fellow that does. And he told me to tell you that if you and I will treasure him and delight in him and get to know him, your best days are ahead. And it is asinine to hold on to marbles when we have diamonds. But I got to let go of the marbles to pick up the diamonds. Oh, that we'll do that. Okay. Natalie, would you and Catherine come and help me? what you get for sitting on the front row. <laughs> Let me read to you this quote that I, <clears throat> if you ever get a chance to spend any time with Henry Nowen, do so. He's dead, but you can still spend time with him. Um, he said this, the cross is the main symbol of the Christian faith. And it invites us to find hope where we see pain and to reaffirm the resurrection where we see death. God calls us to be grateful and to trust that every moment of our life can be claimed as the way of the cross that leads us to new life. That's what we're doing right now. We're taking bread, which represents the body of Jesus, and wine, which represents His blood. And we are eating and we're drinking to declare our belief that where there has been death, now there's life. Where there has been death, 
It has been the very venue through which life is created. If that's your hope, if that's your belief, if that's what you're banking on, then I invite you to come and eat and drink and remember and give thanks for the bright future. People on my right and my left, by the way, you come. There'll be people on my right and my left by the windows that would love to pray with you. Please go and have prayer if that is your need.